Welcome to Defenders, Dr. William Lane Craig's weekly class at Johnson Ferry Baptist Church in Atlanta. For more information concerning the subjects on which Dr. Craig speaks, visit our website at reasonablefaith.org. You'll find articles, compelling debates, audio video downloads, an interactive forum, and many more resources. That's reasonablefaith.org. This week we've been inundated with questions about Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mladenov's new book, The Grand Design, which is due to be released later this week. And many people have been concerned by the headlines that they've read in newspaper articles, uh, heard on CNN, there was even an editorial in the Wall Street Journal excerpted from the book, uh, reading why God did not create the universe and people were wanting to know how would how do you respond to these claims of Stephen Hawking this represents a a shift from his earlier position Um, how would you answer well it would be premature for me to give any sort of response to Hawking's new book prior to the release of the book and my actually having had a chance to see the book so what I thought I'd do until I do have a chance to read the book is to suggest some questions that you ought to pose as you consider the claims of this new book. As I read the articles that appeared in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere, it didn't appear to me that this book is saying anything that was not already said in Hawking's earlier bestseller, A Brief History of Time. In that book, you remember, he posed the famous question, what place then for a creator? And he claimed, in fact, that modern science allows no place for a creator of the universe. And I don't see that there's anything different in this new book than what was said in A Brief History of Time. There, Hawking, you may recall, uses quantum gravity to explain the origin of the universe, appealing to the model that he developed with James Hartle at University of California, Santa Barbara. And he uses the quantum gravity to explain how the universe came into being from nothing. And then he appeals to the many worlds hypothesis in order to explain away the fine tuning of the universe. So in the first case, Hawking affirms the beginning of the universe, but thinks that quantum gravity explains its origin. In the second, he affirms the existence of the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life but appeals to the many worlds hypothesis and the anthropic principle to explain it away. So there's nothing that I can see so far that is really different or new in this book, uh, The Grand Design. So what I would encourage readers to do is to first read Reasonable Faith, where I interact with Hawking's views on the origin of the universe and the fine-tuning of the universe, And then in light of that discussion, ask yourself the following questions as you look at Hawking's new book. Number one, what new developments, what new theories are featured in this new book? Is it simply a a re-explanation of the Hartle-Hawking model and the many worlds hypothesis, or is there something new here? If there is not anything new, that's fine. But then we want to ask, how has Professor Hawking then responded to the criticisms of his earlier work that have been issued in the interim? There have been many uh, responses in the literature to Professor Hawking's earlier claims. So does he respond to those criticisms? And if so, how? Secondly, with respect to the claim that the universe came into being spontaneously from nothing, Professor Hawking writes in the Wall Street Journal article, as recent advances in cosmology suggest, the laws of gravity and quantum theory allow universes to appear spontaneously from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist, end quote. Now, what we need to ask Professor Hawking here is, how is the word nothing being used in these sentences? Does he mean by the word nothing 
what the metaphysician or philosopher means, namely non-being? Does he mean literally nothing in the sense of non-being? And if he is using it in this philosophically correct sense, then he needs to address the metaphysical problems of how being can arise from non-being. If his theory suggests that being literally originates from non-being without any sort of cause, then that, I think, is metaphysically problematic and requires an explanation. One problem that would be raised is then why it is only that universes of this sort come into being from non-being. Why not anything? Why not bicycles or Beethoven or root beer? If, if universes can pop into being from non-being without a cause, then why can't anything and everything just pop into being from non-being without a cause? You cannot say that it is only due to certain quantum gravitational uh, constraints because if there's truly non-being, there is no quantum gravity. There's nothing, and nothingness cannot be constrained because nothingness isn't something. It is, it is non-being. So he needs to address those metaphysical problems. Now, if he is using it in this philosophically accurate sense, the statement in the article, quote, the laws of gravity and quantum theory allow universes to appear spontaneously from nothing, end quote, is on the face of it self-contradictory. Because if there are laws of gravity and quantum theory, quantum physics, then it's not true that there is nothing. Uh, and so the statement is self-contradictory on the face of it. He, he can't say that the laws of gravity explain the origin of the universe from nothing, because the laws of gravity are just mathematical equations, and as such, they are abstract objects which don't stand in causal relations. So he must be saying there's some sort of quantum state that exists, not just nothing. Now, if he is using the word nothing here, not in this philosophical sense, but just to mean a quantum state in which the classical concepts of space and time and general relativity break down, then it's not true that we're talking about nothing. Then there is something, and you haven't explained the origin of the universe from nothing. There is something. And one would need to ask, well, why not think that God created that? Why couldn't God have created the primordial quantum state? On what basis does Hawking say God did not create anything? It didn't create the universe. So I think this first claim um, it, it needs to have a lot of questions, a lot of examinations posed uh, if we're to understand it. What about his claim with regard to the fine-tuning of the universe and explaining it by appeal to the many worlds hypothesis? Here's what he has to say in the Wall Street Journal article. Our universe seems to be one of many, each with different laws. That multiverse idea is not a notion invented to account for the miracle of fine-tuning. It is a consequence predicted by many theories in modern cosmology. If it is true, it reduces the strong anthropic principle to the weak one. That is to say, if there are many worlds which are randomly ordered in their constants and quantities, uh, then by chance alone, if these worlds are infinite in number, there will appear finely tuned universes in the world ensemble, and hence observers who must see their particular universe to be consistent with their existence. And so by chance alone, these observers will exist, and the fine-tuning needs no further explanation than chance. Now, here again, questions need to be asked to Professor Hawking, uh, and we need to see whether these are addressed in the book. First, it's not enough to simply posit the many worlds hypothesis as a possibility. We want to know why think that the many worlds hypothesis is superior to theism. Why think that the many worlds postulate is a better postulate than a single cosmic designer? In particular, what mechanism is there that explains the origin of the many worlds? What mechanism brings these 
many worlds into being. And when we've identified that mechanism, we need to, we need to ask, is it fine-tuned as well? If this mechanism, which generates the many worlds, itself exhibits fine-tuning, then in fact fine-tuning hasn't been explained, it's just been pushed back a notch. So we need to ask whether or not this mechanism that generates the many worlds is itself one that doesn't uh, have any fine-tuning involved in it. We also need to ask ourselves the question, or Professor Hawking rather the question, what evidence is there that these many worlds, if they exist, are random in their constants and quantities. If the constants and quantities just occur repetitively in these various worlds, then they do nothing to explain the fine-tuning of the universe. But what reason is there to think that these constants and quantities are randomly ordered across the many worlds? And why should we think that these many worlds are infinite in number rather than finite in number? In fact, when you remember the bord guth vilenkin theorem, which proves that any universe which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion cannot be infinite in the past but must have a, a, a definite beginning, and that this theorem applies to the multiverse, then that means that the multiverse itself, this ensemble of worlds, itself is not infinite in the past but had a beginning. And therefore, we need to ask, how do we know that there are not only a finite number of other worlds that have been generated by now? And if that's the case, then why think that there are finely tuned universes that have appeared yet in the world ensemble? What is the evidence for this? What guarantee is there? Moreover, we would like to know how Stephen Hawking responds to Roger Penrose's objection to the many worlds hypothesis. In his book, The Road to Reality, Penrose argues that if we are just a random member of a world ensemble, then it is incomprehensibly more probable that we should be observing a much different universe than the one we in fact observe. And therefore, our observations make it overwhelmingly more probable that there is no world ensemble. Our observations strongly disconfirm the world ensemble hypothesis. And Penrose therefore argues that this appeal to many worlds and the anthropic principle is worse than useless in explaining the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. And so we'd want to ask how does Hawking respond to the objection of his erstwhile colleague, Roger Penrose, to the many worlds hypothesis as an explanation for fine tuning. Now, we await the answer to all of these questions with bated breath. Uh, and I, uh, I think that that's probably why these teasers were put out in advance in the media. Namely, they do make you want to read the book and see how Professor Hawking will defend his claims and see how he will answer those questions. So once the book is released, we'll re revisit these questions and see whether and or how Professor Hawking has responded to them. For more resources from Dr. William Lane Craig, visit our website at reasonablefaith.org. You'll find articles, debates, audio video downloads, and much more. That's reasonablefaith.org. The copyright for this material is owned by Dr. William Lane Craig.